Well, with more than 10 episodes under our belt, Dan and I have had some impressive guests here, and today we're going to revisit some of those discussions on the BizPo Show. Welcome to the BizPo Show. Well, whether it be governors, astronauts, politicians, or business folks, Dan and I have had some really impressive conversations with our guests so far. And so for today, we thought we might take a look back on some of those conversations and hope you enjoy some of those highlights. Based upon what we see right now, would we have been better served if we had this handled more centralized, let's say, and had the federal government take the lead as opposed to the individual states? Well, I've always felt that in a moment of national crisis, which this is, that the national government should lead the conversation. Now, that doesn't mean they have to do all of it. They have to coordinate with the nation's governors and mayors to make sure that everybody has a voice in it and then that they can play a part in helping to execute the plan. But I do think that we would have been a little bit better off in this country if there had been some at least consistent messaging from the White House. Um, you know, I, you mentioned I got COVID and, and it, I had worn a mask whenever I went outdoors for seven months. And then for those four days that I was in the White House, um, thinking that I was in a safe space because everyone was getting tested, I took that mask off and I got sick. You know, it seems to me that we should be able to interact with each other, not going to, you know, big arenas or big stadiums um, and, and filling them up but going out to restaurants, going out to stores, going out and doing the things that we need to do to help to run our businesses and our families if everyone takes the precautions that are needed. And I think that's where we missed it. Um, the president missed it by not wearing a mask right from the beginning, not necessarily because he was at risk, although we know he caught COVID as well, but more importantly, because he would be setting an example for the American people that was a positive and construction one from a public health perspective. possibly even war in space, right? I know we made movies about that, but that could be the, the future frontier. What are your thoughts on Space Force and the protection and flow of digital information? Well, generally I'm against any added bureaucracy because I think that a significant percentage of the DOD's budget goes to um, Bureaucracy and and a lot of that bureaucracy is is duplication of effort. You know we've got uh, all these different services. We, we there there has been a move over the last couple of decades to do things jointly to have joint uh, efforts in in a in a attempt to to try and overcome some of this uh, bureaucracy, but there is a lot of waste and um, I understand why it, it, it was done. I'm not you know we had U.S. space uh, U.S. Air Force Base Command that was doing pretty much everything that Space Force is doing right now. Uh, the argument is that if you make it a separate force, that, that and this is such an important uh, theater of operations, if you will, that uh, more attention uh, can be put on that uh, and, and more room for growth. And But, you know, putting another service in the mix means one more service that's going to fight over limited resources uh, and, or I should say, finite resources, not limited resources. Um, and which could potentially lead to duplication of effort um, and which which is which could be wasteful. So so we have to strike a, a, a really good balance with that, with the added attention that a separate force could bring towards the, the space theory of operation. You know, the other thing is it can the other point is that it could be seen as antagonistic. Right. This is the first uh, military space force in history. Uh, will it. Uh, uh, spur other the development of other space forces will it uh you know start an escalation of militarization of space um that's that's a potential too that needs to be carefully looked at and carefully balanced with everything everything and let me say one more thing when we have gigantic polluters like china and india you know, we're giving them potentially an unfair advantage on the economic front by us having to do these things related to our climate. Yeah, it's a good two-part question. I'll take that last part first. I think, 
you know, part of the Biden administration wanting to rejoin some of these multilateral agreements is it gives us some more authority to try and get uh, China and India that are huge polluters um, in line with what we want to see happen uh, on the world stage. We're 4 percent of the world's population, but we're 20 percent of the world's uh, pollution that we see. So we're a big contributor to that. Obviously, India and China are also big when it comes to that. So I think, you know, you're seeing a Biden approach that's obviously more multilateral. We can uh, hold folks to account if we rejoin things like that. But, you know, to the original uh, thrust of, of your question, um, Dan, is in the past, I think Democrats have failed to tout some of the job benefits of moving forward in a, in a more green kind of direction with the economy. It's always been framed in, in that kind of one, two jobs versus uh, uh, climate, which has failed us in the past because it's a great argument, right? You have a thousand jobs that were just cut overnight with the Keystone XL pipeline, and that's a really effective uh, argument to be made against canceling that contract. But if you talk about the jobs of the future, if you talk about the fact that in the last three months of the Trump administration, we lost 37,000 manufacturing jobs uh, to overseas companies. Um, I think if you take things in perspective, um, as a whole of the economy, I, I think we're better off when we talk about that trade off because it is a delicate balancing act. And we've got to get better as Democrats and, and people that believe in, in the climate crisis to talking about the job component of this. And it can't happen overnight. These folks that uh, lost their positions uh, with Keystone XL aren't now going to be able to install solar panels tomorrow. Uh, but I think what you saw out of uh, John Kerry and Gina McCarthy are, are kind of domestic and international climate point people in the administration are, you know, how do we in, encourage and empower folks within their to move into jobs that are um, that are climate focused, not having to move themselves physically, but how can we uh, encourage companies to move in that direction within these cities and municipalities? So it is a, a difficult trade off. Um, but again, I, I think if we do our best level work to to not uh, emphasize that trade off, I think we're, we're going to be better off as Democrats. What would you tell our viewers as far as what business trend they should pay attention? Well, with more people working from home, we know that homes are now going to have to be outfitted differently for doing business. It's no longer just the small business owner that's pulling up the dining room chair. It is now a business placing somebody almost, in essence, in their home. And so an industry that's going to match those needs, I think, is going to be something to be paying attention to because every business in America is now looking at this. Well, we hope you enjoyed that look back through the rear view mirror of these past episodes of the Biz Post Show, but we hope you'll join us as we look ahead through the windshield, as many great guests and great conversations are sure to come. Tune in each week. From Dallas, Texas, I'm Seth Denson. We'll see you soon.